so much for the generous introduction. Uh, so I really wish I could be uh, in Montreal right now. Unfortunately, I got my citizenship last week and um, I'm still waiting for my passport. So hopefully I'll be uh, you know, invited to Montreal uh, again in, in the future. I wanna give you um, an overview of my latest research. So this paper I, I wrote a couple of months ago and it's a direct continuation um, of my sparsity work that I've done um, a couple of years back. So it's, it's essentially um, continuation of an old story about spike and slide priors. However, I'll be looking at these popular priors from a predictive point of view as opposed to estimation uh, point of view. So the talk is adaptive Bayesian prediction, predictive inference. So whenever people ask me, what do you think are the benefits of, of being a Bayesian? Uh, I typically give two, two, two answers. One of them is um, being able to perform inference, getting uncertainty uh, quantification using posterior distributions. I think that's a uh, non-trivial non, um, non benefit of being, being Bayesian. Uh, and the other one is adaptivity. So oftentimes we uh, have to perform some hyperparameter tuning using cross-validation in order to improve performance, improve prediction performance or estimation performance. And Bayesian methods somehow have a way of self-adapting with a clever choice of priors. You can actually achieve adaptive uh, minimax rates, adaptive performance, without having elaborate, having to do elaborate tuning. So these two um, themes, the inference theme and the adaptivity theme will be uh, permeating through my talk today as well. These are the themes that we've, that we are used to from, from Bayesian uh, non-parametrics. Uh, I'll be reiterating these themes in the context of predictive inference. So my um, estimation framework is very simple. It's, it's one of the simplest statistical models. It's essentially predicting a Gaussian observation from Gaussian data. So my observations come from normal distribution and dimensional uh, with unknown mean vector beta naught and a standard covariance matrix. Uh, the beta naught vector is um, unknown, as I said, but we will make some assumptions about a certain structure of the signal. Sorry about that. And the structure is sparsity. So essentially, we are in a situation where n, the number of observations, and n is also the dimensionality of the mean vector, increases to infinity. And we hope to actually predict the new observation y, which arises from the uh, similar likelihood, uh, again, underpinned, under, uh, underpinned by beta naught, which is the same mean, essentially. But the variance might be different. So r is the variance of the future observation which may be different from one, and R is assumed to be known. The parameter we don't know is beta naught, but we assume that it's uh, sparse, so it does have uh, some, some structure we can leverage. And the structure we're looking at here is the uh, kind of um, Elna sparsity where we have up to Sn signals, uh, there will be Sn uh, non-zero elements, and then N minus Sn zero elements. And we assume that n goes to infinity, s n goes to infinity, s n over n goes to uh, goes to zero. So it is, I said, kind of a trivial model, but it's actually not quite trivial, right? Because it's high dimensional estimation problem. Uh, we have been, um, you know, over the last decade or maybe even longer, uh, we have been trying to understand estimation estimation procedures for beta, and um, under sort of sparsity restrictions. Uh, we know a lot about the performance of posteriors for estimating beta naught. We know a lot about the performance of modes of posteriors, such as lasso, for estimating beta naught. But we don't really quite know much about the properties of the predictive distribution of y given, you know, x uh, when beta naught is sparse. So the problem here is not to really estimate beta naught, but is to predict y. We are not looking at point prediction, but we are looking at distributional prediction. So we want to get uh, just a distribution over all plausible values of y, having known, having observed x. So we look at entire predictive density. So we want to estimate a density of y given x. Okay, that is close to the true uh, data generating mechanism for y in some in some sense. In this work, we kind of follow, uh, follow up on two papers, um, which uh, have been kind of laying down a lot of foundation that I will, I'll be building on. These two papers are from 2015, 2022 by Mukherjee and John Stone. And traditionally, actually this literature goes back even into the 60s. And traditionally, people have been looking at KL loss, kumba kleiber loss. So I'll be judging the quality of an estimator of the density we had 
by uh, its departure from pi of y, given beta naught that we don't know, in terms of the KL divergence, which is uh, outlined here. So we want obviously this to be small, right? Uh, but we want it to be small for um, all the plausible uh, realizations of the data X. So we look at risk, which is essentially integrated loss, where we look at uh, all say, pl uh, plausible or we integrate out over all possible realizations of the data X that we observe. And that's essentially our risk function here. And we want to make sure that our estimator will minimize this risk for all values of the underlying parameter beta. So here is a little typo here. I should have had a beta not here. Uh, but it, ultimately, we are integrating out uncertainty with respect to y and x. And we want to make sure that this risk is small for uh, all you know, um, um, values of beta. So um, it is known that um, in order to get a high quality uh, predictive density estimator, it might be a good idea to go Bayesian. So uh, one possibility is to um, take advantage of the posterior and construct a, what we call a base of steer predictive density estimator, uh, which is constructed as follows. We essentially take the likelihood of the data y, or the future observation y, and we integrate the uncertainty uh, about beta naught using the posterior of beta given x. It's a very natural object. It's very coherent, right? And it makes sense to somewhat in integrate out uncertainty using the data that we have observed. So this is what I'll be referring to as the base predictive density estimator. And I will be uh, looking at properties of this estimator under various priors. OK, so this posterior arises from, you know, obviously prior distributions. And I'll be discussing three popular choices. Uh, one of them will be the Laplace distribution arising um, in the context of Bayesian lasso. Uh, we know that, you know, there's a Bayesian motivation there. Um, the second prior uh, I'll be discussing is a spike and slab uh, prior um, for sparse, you know, uh, situations where we have a um, Dirac measure at zero for the spike. I'll explain that later. And the third one is a spike and slab lasso prior, which is the one that I um, wrote about a couple of years ago. So these are my three essential priors, and I'll be comparing them um, from this predictive point of view, essentially looking at risk of, of the predictive density. Uh, estimator under these three priors. Now, at this point, I would already expect a question, uh, and that's um, the following. So what if I just plug in an estimator of beta, right? Having observed x, I can estimate beta not x, I can just plug it into this likelihood to obtain a density for y, right, given x. So why would we want to average out the uncertainty as opposed to plugging in an estimator? And that's a question that was asked before and it was actually partially addressed or maybe fully addressed in previous works. So I will just uh, try to re reiterate some of these arguments. Uh, so why don't we just plug in, right? So it has been shown, and then this is a, from a paper by I think uh, Aitkinson in, in the 70s, uh, that in non-sparse setup, so it's a Gaussian prediction problem where we, we don't have an increasing to infinity, but it's a finite dimensional situation without sparsity. Uh, so he showed that actually the risk under the plug plug-in estimator, Emily estimator, is uniformly dominated by the Bayesian predictive density under a uniform prior. So this is already a strong enough argument to um, prioritize perhaps averaging over plugging in. Um, and that argument has been also iterated by Mukherjee and Johnston in 2015, who looked at this high-dimensional scenario and increasing to infinity with sparse beta. And they made the following comparison. So they calculated actually the minimax risk, which is uh, the best worst case scenario, where we look at the, the risk, uh, the maximal risk for uh, sparse vectors, beta naught, and we want to minimize the maximal risk over all possible density estimators, right? And they calculated that the minimax risk is kind of um, interesting, right? Because it, it relates to the minimax risk of estimation of beta naught, uh, up to a constant, which essentially depends on R. And R, if I go back, will be the variance of the future observation. So the variance of the future observation determines the minimax risk. And it relates to, the, so this, this, is, this will be a familiar part from the estimation, but the multiplication constant does depend on R. So that, that, that was a, you know, um, a very nice, um, maybe confirmation of intuition about what the minimax risk would look like. 
But what they also did is they calculated the minimax risk for plugin estimators, where we restrict these p hats to the plugin choices. And they found that the minimax risk for these plugins is actually uh, has a different multiplication constant, which depends on R, but it's it's one over R as opposed to one over one plus R. And this may create issues for small R. And small R is when we are essentially trying to predict a uh, future observation from noisier data than we have. When R is smaller than one, it's close to zero. We're essentially trying to predict uh, from noisy data. And this is where these plugin estimators will blow up. Uh, on the other hand, the base estimators will be somewhat protected. So that's another argument for perhaps using uh, averaging over plugin. And I'll try to demonstrate it visually because I was, was per perhaps maybe not, not as, as, as convinced um, when I first you know, saw these arguments. So I just wanted to kind of get some visual intuition for what's going on. So here we have a one dimensional situation where the data X came from a univariate Gaussian and R is equal to 0.5. So the variance of the future data is 0.5 and the unknown uh, mean is equal to zero. So the true predictive density will be centered at zero because that's the true parameter, right? It will have a smaller variance than the actual likelihood of the data uh, you know, that, um, that we observed, which is the black curve. And then we have the blue and the red. The blue would be the base predictive density estimator under the uniform prior, which is uh, essentially centered around the observation of X. So X is one realization you know, of data arising from this distribution. And we essentially construct the predictive density around X. And uh, the spreading around X may, may differ, right, depending on whether we are averaging or plugging in. If you plug in, that's the uh, red curve here, the variance is kind of the same, but um, there might be uh, some sort of discrepancy in the tails. So the question is, do we prefer the blue curve or do we prefer the red curve? Based on one realization of X, it may not be obvious, right? Because the KL divergence might be sensitive to the tails. It's a kind of, very, you know, it, it, it might not be entirely obvious, but think about when you average over all possible realization of X, you know, then in some sense, what happens is that on average, the uh, base estimator, which is maybe perhaps a little bit more spread out, gives, gives us the smaller risk. So when you look at the risk, the base estimator is indeed better in terms of the average performance. And that's, that's kind of what's, what's going on. So we have to look at, you know, all possible realizations of X and having the performance, you know, to, to perform well on uh, average. Okay, so as I mentioned before, I'll be looking at the base predictive density estimators in a sparse setup under three popular priors. Uh, one of them is a single Laplace prior, which gives rise to the Lasso estimator. So the Lasso estimator is a mode under the Laplace prior. So what I'm assuming here is that there is a penalty lambda, which determines the sharpness of the prior. We have a Laplace distribution and lambda determines the, uh, the variance. So when lambda is large, we have a prior that's kind of sharp, sharply concentrated around zero. Uh, for small lambda, we have a more spread out prior. We know from um, theoretical results by many authors that the mode has good properties. Um, it's great to, you know, compute, it's rapid uh, for, for model estimation. Um, it turns out that the posterior itself, not just the mode, but the entire posterior may not have as, as great properties. So that also has been established that um, if you look at the mode, it's okay. But if you look at the posterior itself, if you wanted to use the posterior for uncertainty quantification, that may not be a good idea. Uh, so. Then I'm going to be talking about spike and slab priors. So these priors essentially think about sparsity in a different way. So as opposed to looking at the mode, which kind of gives me the sparse zeros, right? Um, that's what Lasso is relying on to have a mode which is sparse. Uh, instead of just relying on a mode, we can just kind of induce the sparsity by assuming two scenarios. Um, in scenario one, the coefficient is negligible or it, it is unimportant, uh, meaning it's, we can just zero it out, right? And in scenario two, there is signal, right? And we kind of tr try to determine between these two scenarios, these two realities based on data. So we allow the coefficient to come up, come from these two scenarios, either signal, the coefficient came from some distribution which is spread out over larger values, or noise, in which case the coefficient is set equal to zero. And we flip back and forth between these two uh, 
scenarios using an indicator, which is either one for signal or zero for noise. And of course, we don't know what that is before we see the data. So we want to, in fact, estimate the label, the coefficient, uh, the switching indicator uh, from the data to determine which, which scenario we are in. And a priori, each coefficient has some sort of chance of being considered to be signal. So I mentioned that um, we have n coefficients. We have Sn no zeros. So if I knew Sn, my prior guess, you know, if somebody asked me, what is the probability of a coefficient to be non-zero? I would say, well, it's Sn over n. So there is some sort of, um, you know, proportion or some at least assumption about, um, you know, the number of non-zero coefficients or the proportion of non-zero coefficients. And that information, if you, have, if you have knowledge of Sn, can be transmitted into the prior through theta. So theta is thought of as a kind of like a prior proportion of signals. And if you don't know it, you may even want to assign a prior over it. So I'll be talking about two scenarios, fixed theta when we know Sn, and then random theta when we don't know Sn. Of course, things get a little bit more interesting when we don't know Sn, and that's going to be part of my later. OK, so this prior has been shown to have, to have great properties in terms of uh, yielding posteriors that shrink at minimax rates, minimax rates in L2 sense, minimax rates in L infinity sense. Uh, there's so much theory on, on spike and slot priors. Um, it's, a, you know, uh, it seems to be a wonderful object uh, yielding uh, wonderful prior, yielding wonderful posteriors. However, there has not been uh, a lot uh, theory on the predictive performance of these, of these priors. So this work is, is meant to kind of fill that gap. Okay, so that's the spike and slab. And then the last one, uh, last, last prior I'll be discussing is the spike and slab lasso, which uh, was uh, my creation from uh, a while back, uh, which is essentially continuous relaxation of this prior where we assume a particular structure for these two distributions. Uh, instead of a Dirac measure at zero, sorry, it's my mouse is just so sensitive, sorry. Um, instead of a Dirac at zero, we essentially assume a Laplace distribution concentrated sharply around zero. So it's like a continuous relaxation of the Dirac. And for the slab distribution, for the signals, we assume a Laplace, which is a little more spread out. So it's a mixture of two Laplaces. So you could think of these as Laplace distributions underpinned by parameters lambda 1 and lambda naught. Lambda naught is the large penalty for the noise, and lambda 1 is the small penalty for the signal. And we have the same situation, right? It is before. So we have two scenarios, signal and noise. Uh, it's just uh, we slightly modify the uh, distribution of the um, of the noise, allowing it to have negligibly small, not exactly zero values, but negligibly small. This continuous relaxation yields uh, certain uh, benefits for computation. Uh, if you are interested in modes, uh, model estimation, also perhaps if you are interested in estimating beta coefficients, because smooth uh, priors are perhaps uh, may have uh, better mixing properties uh, and so on. So I think that there are some good reasons to think about these continuous relaxations as well. And um, we have the binary indicators, and again, mixing proportion of theta, which is uh, the prior guess at uh, the proportion of no zeros. So these are the three parameters that I'll be talking about uh, a lot um, in the next couple of slides. So um, you, you could just think of this as kind of like a two-point uh, mixture extension of the, of the lasso prior. OK, so that these are the three priors. Now let's go back to the prediction uh, problem. Uh, I'll be talking about two situations. Um, in the first situation, we have sort of um, independent product prior, meaning that the prior on each coefficient beta, the prior is completely independent. So we construct the prior by essentially aggregating independent, you know, independently the priors for each coordinate separately. It turns out that uh, with these types of priors, the predictive density is also a product density. So the product density for the vector of y given x can be kind of uh, factorized into one dimensional predictive density estimates for each um, coordinate separately. Because of that, the loss function is additive, right? And then the risk function, we can easily see that it can be upper bounded by two kind of components. Again, it's two scenarios, signal and noise. For the signal, right, we have SN signals. So we're looking at the maximal risk for betas that are non-zero, right? And again, there are some typos, beta, not and beta, but I typically mean the same thing. So that's the signal part. And then there is N minus SN noise coefficients, right? And we need to make sure that the risk at zero is, is small, right? So we're looking at the risk as, at zero, 
risk for the non-zeros, we need to make sure that this upper bound is behaving well. And we are essentially trying to match the minimax risk that was quantified by Johnstone and Mukiji. So we are essentially hoping that we can find the upper bound which matches this, this, this minimax risk. Okay, so um, Bayesian lasso. So I want to maybe use this more as a cautionary tale in order to develop this theory for the spike and stub lasso. I have to look at um, the single plus prior first. So uh, there are two objectives here. First of all, uh, I had to understand the risk of a single Laplace prior before understanding the risk of the mixture of Laplaces. And also I wanted to kind of uh, reiterate um, perhaps the um, kind of a cautionary tale uh, about Bayesian lasso that if you were to use the entire posterior distribution for inference, either about beta or for predictive inference, it might not be a good idea. Uh, while that has not been established for the lasso from a predictive point of view formally, uh, it's expected, it may not be surprising, but it has not been formally established. So this 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 part of the talk is kind of formally establishing that Bayesian lasso uh, for prediction may not be a good idea. Plug-in lasso for prediction might also not be a good idea, right? So we, if you want it to be uh, Bayesian, we need to pick pick a better prior distribution. So what's wrong with, 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 with the lasso, right? Um, Bayesian lasso. The problem is that we have signal and noise and we have only one penalty, lambda, right? And the lambda kind of serves um, either one purpose or the other purpose, either estimating signals well or uh, shrinking noise to coefficients to zero. And that's how it kind of uh, manifests itself in the predictive density estimation. So again, the green would be the true de pred predictive density. On the left, we have a noise scenario. On the right, we have signal scenario. In the noise scenario, beta naught is equal to zero, the predictive density, estimator is centered around zero. And then we have the Bayesian predictive density under two scenarios, large lambda or small lambda. Large lambda will be red and the small lambda is blue. Large lambda is, works well when we have noise. Small lambda works well when we have signal. And that can be seen from these two plots. So in the absence of signal, large lambda will essentially push the Bayesian predictive density under the Laplace prior close to the true predictive density. And that's really beautiful, right? This is what we would want. Well, small lambda will not be able to quite shrink, you know, if you observe large enough x, right? You know, we will see that that predictive density is somewhat, you know, far away from where we would want to be. So for the same, uh, you know, uh, for a similar, for the same parameter tuning, but slightly different scenario where, where our sigma is equal to two, we observe, X that's uh, you know around um, say the, the same same distance from the truth, um, three point eighteen um, before we had one point eighteen here. So in the presence of signal, large lambda will push the predictive density again close to zero, right? And the small lambda will kind of do the same thing as the uniform prior earlier, right? It will center the predictive density around the observed X, but it will have like larger variance. So that the KL divergence on average can kind of average towards better, better, better risk. So, so there you see the conflict, right? We have you know one lambda which cannot do both. So what we would need to know uh, formally to prove this, right? So we, we need to make sure if we were to show that uh, Bayesian lasso is is predictive optimal, minimax predict predictive optimal, we would need to show that the maximal risk for the non-zero beta is bounded by this quantity, and the risk at zero is bounded by this quantity. It turns out that we can get some upper bounds on the on, on the two scenarios, and you can see that for the risk, in order for it to be um, you know to be satisfying this requirement, we would need lambda to increase with uh, say at a speed n over s n or n. So that calibration, however, would blow up the upper bound for the uh, for the signals. So you can see that the you know it's it's just not possible to achieve the you know the optimal calibration with one lambda. On the other hand, the lambda calibration, which is uh, the log n over Sn, which works well for prediction, that would work well for the signals, but it would not be enough to you know, diminish to obtain this bound for noise. So, uh, so we cannot really obtain a calibration using um, a single lambda that would give us, say, a um, good enough upper bound. And uh, from a lower bound argument, we can see that in order for to, uh, for the lasso to satisfy to to, um, to have um, you know good enough risk, we would need uh, indeed lambda to be to be much faster than uh, log uh, n over s n. So um, from this kind of um, combination of, of, of thoughts, we we conclude that 
um, Blasso is just not not able to um, achieve achieve um, these two goals with a single lambda. Um, that can be also seen from the plot of the predictive risk. So here we have uh, beta on the uh, x-axis and the risk on the y-axis. Of course, there is a typo here because that's loss of risk, not spike, it's not loss of risk. It's a Bayesian loss of risk for various choices of lambda. So as we see, the risk at zero will be small for lambda that's large. The risk at uh, non-zero values will be small when lambda is small, right? And as we increase lambda, we are, we are sort of, you know, uh, decreasing the risk at zero, but we are increasing the risk for the non-zero. So, you know, that's that's where the conflict comes from. So I think this is a, a kind of a good good place to appreciate the um, benefit of two-point mixtures, the mixture priors for sparse situations. And I'll talk about the spike in slab lasso uh, for fixed theta. So theta is for the situation where we know Sn. Sn is, again, the number of non-zero coefficients. Of course, in reality, we don't know Sn. Um, and that's why it's it's super important to think about adaptive estimation procedures. Uh, in this work, I'll, I obtain uh, what I would call perhaps the first adaptive results for predictive density estimation uh, without the knowledge of SN. But first, in order to kind of outline the argument, I will assume SN is, uh, is known, meaning that theta is fixed because I will use SN to calibrate theta. So when theta is fixed, we again have predictive density estimator that's a pro, you know, product form. The prior is independent product. The predictive density will be independent product. Uh, this is the two-point mixture prior, right? It's the spike. The spike is here. The slab is here. The marginal uh, predictive, um, the marginal likelihood will be denoted by mj. So that's the marginal likelihood of x. That's the data we observe. So when we integrate the likelihood over the prior under the spike or the slab, you get these two marginal likelihoods. Now. What's most important is actually this quantity over here. So uh, I think that you know the paper has a lot of um, a lot of pages of calculations, but I think that perhaps the most interesting is this one line, which is uh, you know just a two liner of a proof. It's just very very simple, and it kind of outlines the elegance and the beauty and the simplicity of spike and slab priors. So when you look at the predictive sorry predictive density under the spike and slab prior, the prior is a mixture. The predictive density is a mixture. It's a mixture of predictive density under the slab prior and under the spike prior. And the mixing weight, the mixing weight is between 0 and 1. And it's right here. The mixing weight essentially is a kind of a base classifier. So if you were to, if you observe x, which is the data that we have, right? We observe x, we want to predict y from x. So if you observe x, we can ask ourselves, what is the, say, likelihood that x arrived from the slab model or versus the spike model. And this would be essentially kind of what the base classifier for. So that's kind of cool, right? Because when x is large, it's far away from zero, we have a reason to believe that the underlying beta is also non-zero. And that's why we want to use the slab portion of the prior. And in that case, this weight will be close to one because this classification probability will be close to one. On the other hand, if x is small in absolute value, maybe the underlying coefficient is zero, in which case this probability will be close to zero and the predictive density will get dominated by the spike predictive density, which is kind of sharply concentrating around zero. So this is a beautiful kind of automatic mechanism which kind of uh, determines the amount of shrinkage, which determines essentially which scenario we are in, is it signal or noise, without actually making a decision ahead of time. We just you know look at the data, we update, and then we construct our estimator by you know, essentially pasting together or mixing together two predictive densities. And when you look at this uh, classification probability even closer, uh, I think it's kind of neat to just highlight the fact that it depends on a base factor. So base factor in Bayesian statistics is one of the staples for model comparisons. So it's a ratio of marginal likelihoods under two priors. And when the ratio is above one, we have a preference for one model over the other model. And what's really cool is that this weight, this mixing weight, which determines how much we borrow from the spike or the slab, depends on two quantities, right? It's an inverse of a quantity which depends on the prior odds of spike versus slab, right? There's the prior odds. And then also the marginal likelihood, the base factor, the marginal likelihood ratio. And this prior odds is super interesting. So it's really important for calibration. So it will come back at multiple occasions. 
when, whenever you see one, one minus theta over theta, you know, I'm always thinking that it's super important to be able to kind of control uh, this, this ratio, this prior odds, and to calibrate the prior properly to get the optimal rate. So this mixing wave this is just the magic that kind of makes everything happen. And again, it's all based on just probability. This, these are the marginal likelihoods for X. There's no Y here, just X. Marginal likelihood under the slab prior, marginal likelihood under the spike prior. And then if you observe X right, right over here, you can see that the spike marginal likelihood is more likely than the slab marginal likelihood. In which case, this weight will be close to zero, right? If you observe X that's large, then we have the opposite, right? The slab is more likely than the spike marginal likelihood, in which case this guy will be close to one. And that's going to, you know, just mix, mix, adaptively mix the two densities in the direction we want. So how does it work? So we, a, a couple of slides ago, I showed you the lasso example, where we had noise on the left and signal on the right. Uh, this is the same scenario. X is, again, 1.18 or 3.18, right? Uh, what's different here is that we have um, now the spike and slab loss, loss of predictive density, which is uh, in the black, it's the black curve. So we still have the single loss of predictive densities, right? Because we are mixing large penalty lambda naught, right? With the small penalty lambda one. Those are exactly the same curves that we had before. The spike with lambda being 10, you know, that it was you know, close to the true predictive density, which is the green curve. And then when lambda was too small, it just couldn't really handle the noise situation. It was too far away, too, too close to the observed value X. But if you mix these adaptively using that, you know, spike and slab uh, construction, automatically the spike and slab prior leans towards the spike. So it's just, you know, it's a mixture. So, you know, obviously it's not exactly, you know, it's a mixture of the two, but it leans towards the spike in the noise scenario and it leans towards the slab in the signal scenario. So, you know, that's just, that's where the adaptivity comes from. You don't need to decide uh, on the, you know, scenario ahead of time. It's just the mixture prior has a way of figuring that out automatically. So in the noise scenario, in the signal scenario, the true predictive density is the green. The slab, uh, sorry, the slab predictive density is, 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 is blue. The spike predictive density is red. The red is obviously wrong. And we can see that the, again, the spike and slab mixture leans towards the slab predictive density, which is the right thing to do. Okay, so just a point of uh, comparison between the spike and slab lasso and the direct version of the prior. The direct version is sharper. So the same phenomenon happens, again, leaning towards the spike, leaning towards the slab. Obviously the spike and slab lasso is, is, a, little, is a continuous relaxation. So um, practically they might be indistinguishable. Theoretically, they are very close there'll be some difference, differences in the multiplication constants in front of the rate. So now let's compare the risk for the lasso, for the Bayesian lasso, which has only one Laplace component. We've seen this before. We can see that the risk at zero can get smaller if we increase lambda, but increasing lambda increases the risk for the non-zero, so we are in trouble. But the spike and slab risk is, is quite interesting. It's got this kind of up and down heartbeat wave, right? Where as we increase, actually, uh, eta is the is the theta, <laughs> so that's a wrong notation. That's the mixing proportion. So if we anticipate that there is more um, signals, right, eta gets smaller, right. If we anticipate that there is, um, uh, sorry, eta gets smaller when we anticipate that there is less signal, right. So if 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 that's what's going on, we can actually de decrease the risk at zero by decreasing eta without necessarily increasing the risk at the non-zero. So, so that's beautiful, right? Because we have one parameter, the theta mixing proportion that we can modulate to kind of adjust the risk at zero, keeping everything else kind of intact. So the risk for the non-zero will be essentially the risk of the slab, which is essentially the same as here. But on top of that, we can modulate, we can decrease the risk at zero by borrowing from the spike, right, using this mixing proportion if it's properly cal calibrated. Okay, so theory. Uh, so I have a spike and slab lasso version of this result, but, but you know, for the sake of just simplicity, I'll present the direct version. So if we calibrate the prior odds properly, so that means one minus theta over theta will be n over Sn. Remember, theta is the proportion of signals. The oracle scenario is Sn over n. The prior odds that corresponds to that is n over sn. So that's the oracle calibration. If you use that, right, and if you use lambda for the slab, 
which is, you know, suitably small. There might be some dependence on R, but we keep it fixed. We don't let it increase. We just kind of keep it fixed in some, some area. As n goes to infinity, as n goes to infinity, as n over n goes to zero, the risk, right, the, the, the risk actually matches the minimax rate with multiplication constant of five and plus some, some, some term which does not depend on n. So uh, that's essentially concluding that the uh, spike and slap mixture, the direct spike in the Laplace slab can achieve the rate minimax performance for prediction which is nice. Uh, it's a kind of, a, I would say, a new conclusion because this prior in this, in this particular form has not been studied. Uh, but I would have, what bothered me is it's not adaptive as all because in reality, I don't know SN. So it's nice to know that in Oracle situation, I can make it work, but I care about practice. So I care about, you know, what if I don't know SN? Uh, this is a version of the same result, but for the spike and slap lasso, um, for, for the sake of time, maybe I, I can just talk a little bit about the differences. Uh, here, um, the spike is the lasso is, is, is a little little different, right? Because we have three parameters as opposed to two parameters. We have the lambda naught, we have lambda one, and we have theta. So the calibration of this prior may uh, require a little bit more, a little bit more thought. But again, if we have S n, if you know S n, we can let the spike very spike parameter increase at the rate of n over, over S n. Uh, and even if we if we don't really assume the the prior odds increases at the rate of n of s, and we can still achieve the um, minimax rate um, with perhaps a slightly larger multiplication constant. Um, so I would say that, you know, from uh, estimation rate point of, point of view, these two priors are in the same equivalence class. Um, um, but again, it's a non-adaptive result because it's, uh, it's uh, for the situation when s is known. The risk uh, functions for this spike is blah so we can think about what they look like when we change the parameters slightly. But again, this is a calibration for the spike is blah so prior. I might want to talk uh, about the non-adaptive version first before, you know, if there is any time left, I can go back to this line. So right now, let's think about what happens when SN is not known. So when did it ever happen to you in practice that a practitioner would come to your office and they would say, okay, I need you, you know, I have a situation, I'm looking at 10,000 genes, and I know that only uh, 10 of them are in fact, you know, um, influential in this in this regulatory pathway, right? So barely ever, sometimes it does happen, but barely ever we have information about the SN, right? So we would need to, to uh, apply a procedure which can adapt to SN. And that's what we are gonna do now. So in order to adapt to SN, we have to assume that theta is unknown and it came from some, some suitable prior. So theta is the mixing proportion. It lives between zero and one. We don't know what it is. In the case uh, where we suspect sparsity, we can actually make this beta distribution to be sharply, more sharply concentrated around zero. We can pick something like A equals one, B equals N. That's how we kind of communicate through the prior that there is sparsity. We just don't, don't want to commit to particular level of sparsity, like 10% or 20%. We put a distribution over sparse values of theta, right? And that's what you're gonna do. So the prior right now is not an independent product anymore. It's a mixture of independent products, right? Here I'm using the direct version again, but the idea extends to the spike and sub also as well. So we essentially integrate out the mixture prior over the prior distribution of the theta. So it's a mixture of mixtures. What happens to the predictive density in that case? Well, the predictive density is also a mixture of mixtures. We know that if we know theta, the predictive density is a mixture of the spike predictive density and the slab predictive density, where the mixing weight depends on theta. It has this beautiful, you know, transitioning right quality to it. Uh, and then, you know, if we have a prior on theta, what happens to the, to the predictive density is that we essentially integrate this predictive density with respect to the posterior of theta given x. And that integration of over the posterior of theta given x is, is where the magic happens, right? Because when you observe x, right, when you observe your data, you can estimate theta, right? You, you can, in the posterior of theta given x has already a lot of information about how much signal there is. So if you assume a beta prior, right, we, we, we observe x, we look at the posterior of theta given x, the, you know, the beta distribution, the, post the posterior will somehow be informative, will be more informative about how many signals we have 
And we are hoping that it will concentrate somewhere close to S and over N, right? And if so, then obviously this predictive density will be max optimal because we've seen uh, from the previous work that for theta being fixed at S and over N or some, some multiple of that, we can make it work. So now the hope is in you know showing that the property of this posterior is well and good enough in order to obtain a good property of the averaged um, posterior predictive density. So another equation in the paper, which is kind of revealing and perhaps just trivial and simple, but revealing is the following. So the predictive density estimator is a mixture of mixtures again. It's a mixture, it's an average predictive density estimator, right, of the spike and slot, where we average over the posterior of theta given x. And again, this is where the magic happens. So maybe it's obvious, but it, it, it's, it's, it's somewhat revealing, right? How Bayes has a way of kind of figuring things out and learning from the past in some, in some ways that makes sense probabilistically. So because of this, we can immediately see that, that the, uh, sorry, that the Kulbach-Leibler uh, loss can be upper bounded by the average Kulbach-Leibler loss for the fixed data where we average over the, this posterior. Again, simple insight from, you know, Jensen's inequality, but it will faci facilitate the um, analy uh, analytical you know, um, the analysis of this um, predictive density under non-separable time. So the upper bound on the risk in this case, before it was very simple, right? We had the n minus Sn times the risk at zero, right? And the Sn times the, plus the Sn times the risk at non-zero, right? That was for the separable case, but here we have a non-separable situation. Uh, however, we can show that the upper bound on the risk is a very similar structure um, however, the upper bound actually essentially depends on the behavior, right, of, of this kind of um, prior odds of spike versus slot. So we have n minus Sn uh, noise coefficients, and uh, essentially the upper bound um, um, uh, contains uh, prior odds of slap or spike if we know theta, if we know that S uh, theta is equal to Sn over n, right, you can just plug that in. And we obtain a term, right, which is going to kill this n term. So for fixed theta, if we know theta, we can, you know, plug it in, and we immediately obtain uh, the right, um, the right kind of canceling on this term. Uh, but the reality is we don't. So we need to make sure that this, we control this expected prior odds, right? Um, and then we have SN signals, and the situation is similar. We just have a reverse of, of that odds, right? It's log odds, in fact. And if you know Sn, uh, theta Sn, right, we, we know that theta should be, this should be n over Sn, and this will give us the log n over Sn that we need to put a min max right there. So it's all about essentially showing the, the behavior of this posterior averaged over the realization of the data that we observed. So these are the conditions we need to verify. And fortunately, you know, it's not too difficult to see that the prior odds can be bounded for fixed x using um, these bounds, where b is the uh, coefficient of the beta prior. So we start with theta prior beta, beta prior a and b. We update the odds after having observed x, and we see that the upper bound on the odds depends on a and b, but it also depends on the average Sn, which is the kind of a L0 norm of, of, the, of the coefficient beta, underlying coefficient beta. So if Sn, right, is the sparsity, then if we choose B equals N, we have the Sn over N. So the choice of A and B is typically A equals something like one or two, and we let B depend on the sample size N, which will give me the right kind of scaling Sn over N. And the reverse is true for the reverse odds, so we can upper bound it by N over Sn. There might be some, some typos, no, actually, no, it's, it's correct. So, so we need to just make sure that if we look at the average behavior of these odds, where we average over x, right? Now we, we you know we are averaging over x. We need to make sure that we, we don't really overshoot to us and uh, too much because uh, we have the underlying coefficient beta which um, underlies x. So so it's just extra manipulation uh, in order to show that uh, when we look uniformly over all betas and we average over the data of x, the posterior odds. Is going to be bounded by this quantity. Uh, the first upper bound falls from work by Castillo and Devard. So this was essentially just a simple conclusion um, with some, you know, just just a simple uh, extension of, of their of their work. Um, for the reverse, for the second uh, upper bound, we needed to make sure that um, 
the theta, right? So making sure that we don't overshoot the dimensionality is easy, right? Because we have up to SN signals and not all the coefficients are strong enough to be detectable, right? They may be non-zero, but they may not be strong enough to be detectable. But for the upper bound, you know, for overshooting, that's fine. The problem is the undershooting because if the coefficient is not strong enough, it will not be detected by the posterior. So we need to also make sure that we look at the um, expected one over SN, that the S, this will not blow up, right? So the, the coefficients are indeed strong enough to be detectable. For that reason, we need to impose some sort of beta min condition, which is uh, somewhat you know, typical in these scenarios. Uh, it is uh, perhaps even a little weaker than other beta min conditions for spike and snap priors. And for this beta main condition, you can actually show that you can exactly recover the, the subset of non-zero coefficients, right? So it's a consistent uh, for, for subset recovery. That means that, you know, you can actually recover uh, all of the signals uh, well. And under that beta main condition, you can control the second odds, um, make sure that uh, the posterior does not undershoot the dimensionality. So that was just, you know, a perhaps long way of arriving at the desired result, which uh, is summarized here. I put perhaps too much detail on the slide because um, sometimes people ask me things about uh, calibrating uh, the um, the penalty for the slab. So we can talk about that. But the main conclusion is here. So if I don't know SN and I assign a prior on theta such that it concentrates most of its mass around zero, which can be achieved by using A equals two and B equals N plus one, right? There's no SN that's used in the calibration, in the prior calibration. So if I use just this prior and no beta min condition, no beta min condition, I can achieve actual upper bound on the, on the risk, which is nearly minimax. Okay, SN R plus, plus one log N is nearly min minimax up to a log factor. If I'm willing to assume the um, beta min condition, I get SN log N over SN, which is the actual minimax rate. Um, you know, and it's, a, it's an adaptive rate, meaning that I have not used SN to calibrate a prior to obtain this, uh, this minimax rate. And that's, in fact, the first um, minimax uh, rate optimal result for predictive density estimation. Um, so, um, again, it, it's not entirely unexpected. We know that BASE has a way of ad uh, adapting, but uh, it has not been formally established in the context of predictive density estimation. And uh, so, um, I was actually quite uh, quite pleased to find out that the intuition uh, you know is, is correct and we can indeed rely on uh, base Bayesian procedures for, for prediction. Um, I have just one more slide. It's essentially a thank you slide. Um, but before getting there, I may just want to highlight the fact that the calibration for the slab um, penalty um, was quite delicate. so um, it may need to depend on, uh, the ratio of the future variance of the future observation and the observed data x. Um, but, you know, again, it's, it does not depend on, on the sample size. So this is just making sure that, um, you know, the multiplication constants uh, in final rate and some additional terms are small enough. But uh, we may require um, being quite careful about the tuning when uh, the variance of the future data is smaller than the variance of the observed data or when the variance is larger. Uh, we may need to slightly modify the calibration for, for the slab portion of the prior. But again, we have not used SN in this case to obtain the adaptive result. So I would just like to conclude that, you know, a couple of years ago, I got really excited about spike and slab priors for estimation. Uh, you know, the spike and slab lasso was sort of my, um, 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 one of my sort of um, contributions to, to statistics and I, and, and I was, was, was quite quite pleased with, with uh, its, its estimation properties. And a couple of years la later, I just kind of uh, came across the predictive density estimation literature and I, and I thought, well, it might be kind of cool to find out whether uh, we can you know, rely on these priors for predictive density estimation as well and establish some adaptive results which have not been established before. So it was really you know, great fun for me to work on this project and I was really happy to, to share it with you today. I know that I was maybe a little quicker than than usual, you know, um, but I can go back to any any of the slides or add, uh, address any questions you might have. Thank you so much for your attention.